Hey everyone, Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton here with our weekly update on social media. Thanks as always for joining us. A lot to talk about. We have this emerging Hillary Gate, as it's been called, the spy scandal involving the Clinton campaign, her lawyers, some tech operatives, and the Trump White House. You're not going to believe it if you haven't heard about it. Uh, and Judicial Watch, once again, is in the middle with information and lawsuits that should advance the ball in getting the truth about this abuse. Big news, great news in North Carolina, cleaning up election rolls there. I've got some information there. Uh, plus, uh, Judicial Watch has been in a big trial over critical theory in California, this time feminist style critical theory. And then we've got um, more litigation, or I should say more education, in the area of gerrymandering, and I've got some developments to talk about there. So it's funny, when I uh, was pre prepping for this update, I was telling my colleagues, I said, I can't believe all the stuff we're doing. A pile of press releases and documents. Uh, Judicial Watch is doing more than ever to uphold the rule of law on behalf of you, the American people. Now, the big news this week, at least for those of us who care about the rule of law in our Constitution, is the disclosure that happened last week, I guess it was late Friday or um, in the afternoon, whenever it happened, uh, special counsel John Durham filed a brief. And it was a brief uh, where he was fighting the lawyers for uh, Mr. Sussman, the Clinton campaign lawyer who was indicted for making a false statement. Uh, and there's a conflict of interest fight. He says that the lawyers, or at least one of the lawyers, is conflicted, and he's got to pull, uh, he, and so he's filing the brief to make the case. Now, in the brief, he had some really shocking information that he shared with the court, and I'm going to read it to you because uh, other than Fox News and other conservative media, out, media outlets, uh, the big media is lying about what Durham said, misstating what Durham said, pretending at, or characterizing it without quoting it. So I think it's important that I uh, show it to you or at least read it to you. And here's the document here. To, to, you can verify I'm reading from the court document. United States District Court for the District of Columbia, United States of America versus Michael A. Sussman. Now, the factual background is where this information I'm talking about is laid out. Now, the defendant is charged with a one-count indictment with making a material, materially false statement to the FBI less than two months before the 2016 U.S. presidential election. The defendant, a lawyer at a large international law firm, quote, Law Firm One, which is Perkins Coy, uh, that was then serving as counsel to the Clinton campaign, met with the FBI general counsel at the FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C., and this took place in uh, September of 2016. The defendant provided the FBI general counsel with purported data and, quote, white papers, unquote, that allegedly demonstrated a covert communication channel between the Trump organization and a Russia-based bank, Russian Bank One. So that's the Alpha Bank that has been referenced. The indictment alleges that the defendant lied in the meeting falsely stating to the general counsel that he was not providing the allegations uh, to the FBI on behalf of any client. In fact, the defendant, Hillary's lawyer, had assembled and conveyed the allegations to the FBI on behalf of at least two specific clients, including um, one, a technology executive, tech executive one, and a U.S.-based internet company, internet company one, and the Clinton campaign. The defendant's billing records reflect that the defendant repeatedly billed the Clinton campaign for his work on the Russia bank allegation. In compiling and disseminating these allegations, the defendant and tech executive one also had met and communicated with another law partner at the law firm one, who was then serving as general counsel to the Clinton campaign, campaign lawyer one. And that supposedly is Mark Elias, who um, is the leading Democratic Party lawyer in, in the country. Uh, the indictment also alleges that beginning in approximately 20, uh, July 2016, Tech Executive One, who's alleged to be Rodney Jaffe, 
has worked had worked with the defendant, a U.S. investigative firm retained by law firm one on behalf of the Clinton campaign. Numerous cyber researchers and employees at multiple Internet companies to assemble the purported data and white papers. In connection with these efforts, Tech Executive One, this is key, exploited his access to non-public and or proprietary internet data. Tech Executive One also enlisted the assistance of researchers at a uh, US-based university who was receiving and analyzing large amounts of internet data in connection with a pending federal government cybersecurity research contract. And I'm gonna have more on that later. Tech Executive One tasked these researchers to mine internet data to establish an inference, and that's in quote, and a quote, narrative, that's again in quotes, tying then candidate Trump to Russia. In doing so, Tech Executive One indicated that he was seeking to please certain VIPs referring to individuals at law firm one and the Clinton campaign. The government's evidence at trial will also establish that among the internet data tech executive one and and, uh, his associates exploited was domain name system, DNS, internet traffic pertaining to one, a particular healthcare provider, two, Trump Tower, three, Donald Trump's Central Park West apartment building, and four, the executive office of the President of the United States. Tech Executive One's employer, Internet Company One, had come to access and maintain dedicated servers for the EOP as part of a sensitive arrangement whereby it provided DNS resolution services to the EOP. Tech Executive One and his associates exploited this arrangement by mining the EOP's DNS traffic and other data for the purpose of gathering derogatory information about Donald Trump. Now, when they talk about DNS data and resolution data, what they're referring to, and I don't pretend to be an internet computer expert, uh, and I'm sure my colleagues here will correct me if I'm completely wrong here, is that DNS data essentially is your 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 computer systems, uh, your computers, uh, your your internet systems, all have numbers assigned to them more or less. And the way you talk to other computers on the internet, and the way other internet uh, computers are able to uh, allow others to talk to them, at ranging from you know Facebook to Twitter to you know any shopping sites is that you, you, you exchange numbers. You say, I need to go to Amazon. And they don't look for the word Amazon, they look for a series of numbers. And those are the DNS, DNS numbers. And when you go to Amazon, Amazon sees, oh, I have a, ser- I have a computer here with DNS number at, you know, um, you know, eight or nine digits typically, if I, if I recall correctly. So that's what they were looking at. They were looking at where the EOP and Trump's personal uh, computers were where, where they were going. And if you have the DNS numbers, you can figure out what sites they were going. So if you have a computer's DNS number, uh, typically, um, especially for uh, big sites, you know, you can reverse engineer the actual site name. So the numbers are, uh, it's like having the telephone number and doing a reverse number lookup. So furthermore, the indictment further details that on February 9th, 2017, so this is after Trump had been sworn in as president of the United States. He was sworn in in January. The defendant provided an updated set of allegations, including the Russia Bank One data and additional allegations relating to Trump to a second agency of the U.S. government, Agency Two, and that's widely understood to be the CIA. The government's evidence at trial will establish that these additional allegations relied on part on the purported DNS traffic that Tech Executive One and others had assembled pertaining to Trump Tower, Donald Trump's New York City apartment building, and the EOP, and the aforementioned healthcare provider. In his meeting with Agency Two, the defendant, again, the defendant again is Michael Sussman, Hillary Clinton's campaign lawyer. The defendant provided data which he claimed reflected purportedly suspicious DNS lookups 
by these entities of internet pro protocol IP addresses affiliated with a Russian mobile phone provider. The defendant further claimed that these lookups demonstrated that Trump and or his associates were using supposedly rare Russian-made wireless phones in the vicinity of the White House and other locations. The special counsel's office has identified no support for these allegations. So there you have it. Now, what do you hear when I read you that? And you can look at the document. It's widely available online. So what you see here is that they were spying on the Trump White House. Now, the left pretends that's not what the document says because they only reference the EOP. But why would they be looking at EOP data related to Trump during the Obama administration? So you have the big media lying and misleading America, uh, leading, uh, excuse me, mis see, this is where I should just power it through. So what do you see here? Here you have Durham, I think quite explicitly alleging that they were spying on the Trump White House, uh, this Clinton spy ring, as I call it. It's not clear who was paying for it at the time. Uh, there's a little deep, there are some details that need to be ferreted out. But for the first meeting in September, he was working for the Clinton campaign. The left would have us believe that he stopped working for the Clinton campaign when he had the second meeting with the CIA in February of 2017. And the left would have us believe that when Durham says that they were spying on the executive office of the president, he meant the Obama White House, which makes no sense given the document's reliance on, on or, or presentation of evidence that the EOP data related to Trump's uh, and other use, uh, you know, Trump phones associated with Russia. Why would they be examining the Obama White House for Trump phones activity? Doesn't make any sense. Obviously, it was the Trump White House that was being spied upon. So what has happened since this has been released is a firestorm. Fox News put out a big report that I think correctly characterized it. What happened immediately? The left leapt to the defense of Hillary Clinton and started to censor and suppress the information. Facebook, for instance, has censored the Fox News story that broke wide open this filing, the most prominent story on it. I posted it on Judicial Watch's Facebook page and Facebook has vandalized it with a fake fact check warning sign or warning label that it's, it contains false information or something like that. And it leads to a fact check that doesn't even quote this document. So Facebook is engaged in the mass suppression of millions of Americans' right to gain access to that information, specifically a Fox News story on it. And it's not just Judicial Watch that's being censored and suppressed. Senator Charles Grassley, the Republican senator from Iowa, they did the same to his uh, Facebook uh, postings. If you've posted that Fox News story, go check to see how Facebook is labeling it now. So if you think it was just about Hunter Biden that they were willing to suppress information on, no, 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 no. They need to protect Hillary too. Now, Hillary Clinton has pretended this is all conspiracy theories and lies. She hasn't said what's the lie about it. This man's been indicted by Durham. Is that a lie? This man's been indicted for lying about his representation of the Clinton campaign and communications with the FBI. Is that a lie? What was the nature of the Clinton campaign's spying effort on Donald Trump? We see what the evidence suggested, what Durham suggested it was. They were spying him in his home, in his office, and in the Trump White House. And think of the national security um, implications of uh, any executive office of the president, that data being manipulated and misused for political purposes. The EOP is, is supposed to be secure. Well, they had these shady contractors in there, it looks like, that were misusing this data, misusing their contract. So what's interesting about this Durham filing besides the defensive reaction of the Hillary media, is that it highlights the additional crimes that could be a play here for those involved 
in the misuse of this government contract and the misuse of government data for these illicit purposes. Who knew what and when? And it's further reason for Hillary Clinton to be questioned under oath. So this is a big deal. I mean, and on, the, on top of it, people say how outraged they are about it. I don't know what's worse, Hillary spying on Trump or the FBI spying on Trump? What do you think is worse? I kind of think the FBI spying on Trump is worse and working with Hillary to do it. Because I don't see any evidence that anyone blew the whistle on this fake information. They went to the CIA with information suggesting that they had been monitoring um, the executive office of the president of Donald Trump. Even if it wasn't Donald Trump, let's say it was Barack Obama. Why would the CIA think that was appropriate? And why wouldn't they turn them in immediately? The other frustrating thing about this is that Durham has taken three years to get this out to us. If this material had been released, I think, in uh, prior to the 2020 election, I think the election outcome could have been different. Don't you? And of course, Judicial Watch has taken the lead over the years in exposing Russiagate. It's good to see Durham is doing his own independent investigation. These are serious indictments more recently of Sussman and the Fusion GPS, Russia, na Russian national who helped write the, dossier, the fake dossier for the Clinton gang. But now we know the Clinton gang had special access through government contractors to private government data, your data that they weren't allowed to use for the purposes they used it for. Now, of course, they're going to say otherwise, right? But of course, what are they going to say? They're not going to confess to the media. They're going to say they had the right to use this data. And they were investigating Trump and Trump is bad. We'll see if a jury buys it. And I hope, I hope information like this isn't just like uh, being used to help them win a conflict of interest battle with lawyers for Sussman. I hope information like this is the beginning or suggests that there will be more indictments. Because if all of this is the beginning, however long it's taken, I guess, you know, better late than never. But if, this, if it's the end, that would be outrageous. And so, 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 so separately, uh, Judicial Watch, long before Durham was appointed, we were investigating all these issues. And I can go through um, everything that we have uncovered that suggested criminality and misconduct and abuse uh, by uh, Obama and, frankly, um, elements of the Trump administration, deep state, including his own appointees that had it in for Trump and were engaged in a, a coup-like activity. I call it the coup cabal. Hillary Clinton was part of that coup cabal. And uh, we, we don't stop. We don't stop investigating just because Durham's investigating. We always think it's important to have independent information out there for the American people to draw their own conclusions. And the information we get isn't so we, we can't f physically, I mean, uh, legally prosecute anyone. But the more information that's out there, the better, the more likely there is going to be accountability. And it makes it harder, although not impossible, we've seen for the Justice Department to sit back and do nothing, or for Durham to sit back and do nothing. And um, we had a Freedom of Information Act uh, request. It was a, a Georgia state version of the Freedom of Information Act law. It's called the Open Records, Open, Op Open Records Act, the Georgia Open Records Act. Now you, would, uh, you saw in the discussion I, uh, or the, uh, the material I quoted from that there were these other internet researchers that Jaffe was using uh, to help collate and create, uh, get, you know, gain information into Trump's internet activities. And it, based on public reports in the New York Times and elsewhere, they were affiliated with Georgia State University. So what did Judicial Watch do? Well, we asked for the records about their activities from Georgia State University. And we got some very interesting information. And the information is because I I, you may recall in the document here, let me look at this document again, that um, 
these cybersecurity researchers, let me quote exactly from uh, the material here. The assistance of researchers at a US-based university who were receiving and analyzing large amounts of internet data in connection with a pending federal cybersecurity research grant. Well, lo and behold, we got documents that suggest that that grant or that uh, federal research cybersecurity research grant was from DARPA. And what is DARPA? DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It's a, it's a major component of the Pentagon in the sense it's one of these forward-thinking think tanks within the Pentagon that come up with and consider different approaches and newfangled approaches to defense and national security problems. And I think one of the issues they were uh, working on with these researchers are, you know, vacuum up internet data and see what you can draw draw from it in terms of um, a threat analysis. So I think that's the what was going on there, uh, but I don't have access to the contract, so I'm kind of reading between the tea leaves there. And the contract lasted for five years. So that raises the question whether this DARPA research money, your tax dollars, Defense Department resources, access to internet traffic they otherwise would not have been able to obtain without Defense Department authorization was used and diverted to the use for the Clinton campaign to try to destroy Trump. A, keep him from winning the election, and then B, later, trying to destroy him through this coup activity as I've been talking about. And we got the document showing it was DARPA. I mean, what agencies were not involved, either directly, indirectly, knowingly or unknowingly, in the targeting of Trump? More information that the Defense Department's resources may have been used to try to overthrow the President of the United States. And one of the defenses of this crew is they say that, oh, we're, we're you know, we were just, you know, we're just neutral observers and cybersecurity experts and nonpartisan, and this wasn't about politics. Well, these are what the emails say. I mean, they're writing to Jaffe or his people, talking about how they've got the DARPA grant. Well, isn't that interesting? And as I say, no, they're not neutral. In an email, uh, one of the cybersecurity experts writes, the Russians are killing spies with knowledge of the dossier materials. And then there's a, a link to some crazy story about it. Oh, and Trump purged the National Security Council, removing General Dumford and put Steve Bannon, he could quote PR guy, on the NSC. My guess, the purge NSC will now say that Russia has given us great intel on ISIS and that we should lift sanctions now that Russia is helping. The public will have no way to judge this. All this to protect Trump from the dossier materials. This sounds like something straight out of the Clinton campaign. It's like reading Rachel, Mat Rachel Maddow or something. What the bleep is going on? Can you please explain why the GOP is not doing something? And then someone writes a few minutes later, some in the GOP knows what's up, Graham and McCain, but most are all too happy to have their narrow specific agendas advanced, e.g. removing social security, ACA Obamacare repeal, more tax cuts for companies, etc. They put party ahead of country in short. Now that the Russians are killing people with knowledge of the dossier, we can hope for a defector who gets to a non-U.S. embassy in Moscow. I mean, this is crank stuff. And obviously anti-Trump. These were government contractors again. And they were also very interested in going after Steve Bannon, it looks like. An email from Jaffe to uh, the cybersecurity researchers in Georgia says, uh, the subject line is to be added, Jaffe writes, they think he may have some baggage. And they're referencing Bannon. So was Bannon also spied upon by the Clinton spy ring? I don't know. What this raises is the tantalizing possibility that it was, uh, that Bannon was also targeted. But don't you think this is a big deal? 
I do. I'm glad Judicial Watch is doing the basic investigation that the media refuses to do. Much of the big media, all of our major institutional media, except for the notable exception of Fox. I mean, the exceptions prove the rule, don't they? Are spending their time trying to protect Hillary Clinton and trying to minimize the Durham filing that quite specifically ties Hillary Clinton to spying on the executive office of the president, at least through her campaign's lawyers who had these cybersecurity experts mine data that looks like they weren't allowed to mine. Will there be more Hillary Clinton operatives prosecuted? Will she be questioned directly on this? Has she already been been questioned directly on this? I don't know. I don't know. But we also want more information about what went on. And to that end, we have sued the Central Intelligence Agency. We just filed the lawsuit this week. We sued the CIA under the Freedom of Information Act about any communications they had with Clinton's indicted campaign lawyer. This is the request, which we filed, by the way, last year. Crickets from the CIA. So it's a cover-up. All records regarding any meetings or telephonic conversations between any official or employee of the Central Intelligence Agency and Mr. Michael Sussman, formerly an attorney with Perkins Coie, uh, between January 1st, 2015 and the present. This request includes, but is not limited to, all notes, transcripts, summaries, or other records created in preparation for, during, or pursuant the meetings or conversations. How many documents do you think the CIA has about communications with Sussman? My guess is not a lot. But my guess is also they must be pretty darn important because they're completely ignoring our FOIA requests under law. So the CIA is breaking FOIA law, as our lawsuit alleges, to cover up on a meeting that they had with a Clinton operative about their spy operations targeting Trump. As I said, the CIA is in cover-up mode, and we want to know what the CIA is hiding about its role in this plot against President Trump. I mean, you had the FBI involved in targeting Trump, you had the Justice Department involved in targeting Trump, and you can bet the CIA was involved as well. And now we know for sure, according to Durham, that it was the CIA. He doesn't reference Agency 2 as being the CIA, but all the other reporting on it, including from the New York Times, confirms it's the CIA. So what are they hiding? Must be something bad, because they're breaking the law to do it. Again, this is what I love about Judicial Watch. You know, we don't wait for Durham. We don't wait for Congress. We don't wait for the media. We do our own investigations about major corruption scandals because we don't trust anyone. Now, it may be the Justice Department or Durham, they get good information. That's great. They get prosecutions. That's great. Or Congress gets documents. That's great. That's what they're supposed to be doing. But we often know that uh, corners are cut. The Justice Department or or special counsels get nervous about pursuing certain figures and they protect them. And we know what Congress is about, right? And that's why you need independent judicial watch to do these independent investigations. I tell you, if you've been listening to Judicial Watch over the last five years, you'd know all about this. We were right about what what was happening to Trump from the get-go. We understood that Hillary Clinton was involved uh, and it was about covering up her email scandal. And everyone else knew it was about covering up her email scandal, including Obama and Biden. He was, they were briefed on it because they had intelligence. That's exactly what she was doing, making up the Russia garbage to protect herself on the emails. 
which is what we had been saying. It was obvious. And that the Mueller operation was corrupted. We were right. And that ultimately, as we say here, President Trump was a crime victim. And frankly, he is a crime victim. Because they've never stopped the harassment. They've never stopped the harassment. So we've got many lawsuits on these issues that are continuing. More FOIAs going out as we speak. So I don't know what Durham's going to do. Let's hope he does more. But you, I can guarantee you we're going to do more to get more in the way of truth and accountability about the worst corruption scandal in American history, the illicit targeting of President Trump by the Obama and Clinton gangs. And uh, before I go, don't forget Joe Biden's role in all this. He's no innocent babe in the woods on this. He was vice president. He was in key briefings. And of course, he had corruption issues related to Russia and Ukraine and China, and everyone knew about that as well. Remember, Trump was impeached for blowing the whistle and trying to figure out what Biden was up to in terms of Ukraine corruption and the resulting attack on him out of Ukraine to help Hillary. What a, what a tangled web we, we weave, right? Talk about a conspiracy. There was a conspiracy and it was against Trump. And now potentially we're facing the worst security crisis in 60 years with Russia because in my view, Biden's been constrained and compromised by his corruption issues related to Russia and Ukraine. You think Putin doesn't, isn't aware that, that he has Biden potentially compromised and that hasn't incentivized him to take these steps that he's taking against Ukraine? Of course it has. I mean, if Trump were president and Russia was doing this, you'd still have the media, even though they know it was a lie, trying to tie him to Russia. Here we got information that Trump, uh, Biden's family was getting money from Russia and a, a Russia-friendly company in Ukraine, Burisma, and the media is protecting him completely on it. And I don't care what the media says and we're, we're not, you know, it's pretending what we're not allowed to talk about. I'm going to talk about it. And I believe that Biden's corruption is endangering our national security and destabilizing Europe as a result. So pray for peace. But let's, let's keep our eyes clear about what's really going on here. Well, I have some good news, so I guess I should start smiling, right? We settled a lawsuit with North Carolina to clean up their election rolls because you know why? They cleaned up their election rolls. Judicial Watch is the national leader in making sure that the federal law that requires states to clean up election rolls, take reasonable steps to clean up election rolls, is followed. The Justice Department has been AWOL on that. So Judicial Watch has stepped in and filed historic private lawsuits against states and counties to make sure they're cleaning up their roles. You may recall that we sued California a few years back and LA County, and they settled with us. And part of the settlement agreement was they were gonna take steps to remove up to 1.6 million names from their roles. We followed up on that litigation with more litigation against Colorado, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. And just this week, we announced a settlement with North Carolina because they did what we asked. They took reasonable steps to clean up election rolls. In fact, according to the records we examined, they removed 430,000 names from the rolls that shouldn't have been there. Remarkable. And of course, that wasn't done until after we sued. So great news. Our elections are going to be markedly cleaner and less susceptible to fraud because of this cleanup in North Carolina. In June of 2019, there was, so just to be clear, we sued North Carolina and there were two uh, counties that were terrible down there in terms of having dirty election rolls, Mecklenburg and uh, Guilford County. We sued them back in 2020, so it's about two years ago. In June 19, 
Uh, June 2019, the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, which is a federal agency, released data showing that voter registration rates in significant proportion of North Carolina's counties were close to or above 100% of their age eligible, el eligible citizenry. So when you go, just to take a step back, when you've got more people on the rolls that are there than are there and eligible to vote, that's a pretty good indication your rolls are dirty. Judicial Watch's analysis also showed that at the time of the report, the entire state of North Carolina had a registration rate close to 100% of its age-eligible age citizenry. So, you know, people, I, registration rates are a bit higher than they used to be on average, I think. Uh, but, you know, mostly registration rates are around 80%, sometimes 85% at the highest end. When you have registration rates at 100% or higher, there's something wrong. They're not cleaning up their lists. So we, we warned them. They didn't do what we asked them to do, so we sued under the law. And uh, since then, we received additional data from the Election Assistance Commission showing they finally started doing what we sued them to make them do. The total number of inactive registrations, and this is from our settlement a filing with the federal court. The total number of inactive registrations reported by North Carolina dropped from about 1.2 million in 2019 to about 765,000 in 2021, a 36% drop. As I said, 430,000 names. The statewide percentage of inactive registrations dropped from 17% in 2019, which the complaint alleged to be a national outlier, to 10% in 2021, which is close to the median state inactive rate. So the point isn't that you can't have voters on the rolls who are inactive, because there are always going to be voters on the rolls that are inactive. If the, but if the percentage of inactive voters, meaning people who haven't voted more or less in the last two or more election cycles, um, are so high, it means you're not cleaning the rolls off. If someone hasn't voted in six years, and otherwise hasn't communicated that they're still around, you really need to be taking their names off the rolls. And that wasn't going on, it looks like. This is, this is another important step. The number of registrations removed for failure to respond to an address confirmation note, notice and vote in two consecutive elections has increased from about 220,000 for the period reported in 2019 to about 590,000 to the period reported in 2021, a 168% increase. So let me explain what goes on there. You don't vote in an election. What's supposed to happen, at least a federal election, is you should be getting a postcard from your local um, or state election uh, authority asking, hey, you know, you didn't vote. Are you still there? And if they don't hear from you or you otherwise don't vote in the next two federal elections, they are supposed to remove your names from the rolls. So that's like, you know, four or five years, right? Practically speaking. What's the big whoop about doing that? Well, the left hates the idea that you remove anyone's name from the rolls because in my view, they want to be able to have extra names on the rolls to mess around with if they need extra improper votes. That's why we're supposed to have clean election rolls. It mitigates and, uh, and, and um, the opportunities for fraud. When you have names who are on the rolls who are moved away and shouldn't be there, that is an invitation for fraud. That's why the law requires they be cleaned up. And that, so after we sued, they went from 220,000 names that they cleaned up to 590,000 names that they cleaned up. Isn't that remarkable? And in the counties, they had a cleanup rate or the numbers that they cleaned up were increased by 142% in one county and 372% in another county. So that was just great. Now, Judicial Watch isn't like some of these other lawyers out there that uh, just... Uh, will torture you with a lawsuit when there's no good faith basis to do so. And so what happens is we saw that they cleaned up the rolls. And so what we're going to do, 
sue forever over their cleanup. We, so we saw that they did what we asked them to do, where the numbers were what we wanted them to do, and we determined that in good faith uh, that this legal action shouldn't be pursued. So this is what happened. We sued North Carolina because their roles were dirty. They started to clean them up in a significant way, and so we stopped the lawsuit. Victory. So this is great. Now our lawsuits against Pennsylvania and Colorado continue. They tried to get the case thrown out in Colorado, but they were unable to do so. And uh, in Pennsylvania, our case has uh, changed a little bit since we initially filed it, but we're still pursuing it because there are many counties in Pennsylvania that still have issues. And I've told you previously here that we just sent out warning letters to additional states, uh, 14 counties, I think in five states, alleging that there were tens, uh, well over 12 million names on the rolls uh, that uh, have not really been scrubbed. No, wait, excuse me. There are 12 million total voter registration names. And of those names, only 33 have been removed over the last four years under this process that I've been talking about under the National Voter Registration Act. When I say 33 names, there should have been hundreds of thousands of names removed if they were doing their job. I think in all of New York City, which has, I don't know, one or I don't know how many millions of, you know, you could just imagine the millions of voter registrations in New York City. I think they removed 10 names. It's a disaster. So uh, we're planning additional lawsuits. So this is a big victory for, cl for clean elections. I keep on throwing my press releases away before I'm done with them. So this is a big victory for clean elections. Uh, because dirty election rolls can mean dirty elections. That's why we're doing this work. And now that the uh, left and with the acquiescence, frankly, of too many, uh, uh, too many Republicans who don't think s smartly about this uh, are greatly expanding vote by mail, it's more important than ever that our election rolls be clean. But it's not just cleaning up election rolls that's important to um, making sure that uh, elections aren't corrupted and your votes are being uh, treated appropriately and fairly. It's, for instance, the issue of gerrymandering. We sued in Maryland over uh, outrageously gerrymandered districts in Maryland that we allege violate state law. And the trial's been set for March. So we're going to be in trial next month over uh, corrupt gerrymandering in Maryland. And down in Florida, there's another big gerrymandering uh, fight uh, over a district that's a majority minority district uh, that looks improper under law. And our expert, Bob Popper, who runs our election integrity efforts, is a former Justice Department voting rights attorney. He, he went down to Florida this week to testify about this uh, big fight down there. And he highlighted quite correctly that uh, you know the left often likes to play the race card, and frankly, the Republicans let them do it as well, but it's not right under our anti-discrimination laws. Redistricting legislation that is so extremely irregular on its face that it rationally can be viewed only as an effort to segregate the races for purposes of voting without regard for traditional districting principles and without sufficiently compelling justification um, it is legally impermissible, meaning it can be challenged under federal uh, and constitutional claims about uh, up to uphold the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution. So a lot of this gerrymandering is about segregating voters based on race and treating often minority populations in a way that's outrageously discriminatory and disrespectful. Not for the reasons the left pretends that it's being done, usually to advance the interests of the left. And some cynical Republicans are more than happy to have a bunch of majority minority districts because they think, well, uh, minorities aren't big voters for Republicans, so we'll make them all Democratic districts in, in, a, in, a, in a way that's right, impermissible under law. And what's going down out in Florida is there's this majority minority district that looks to be constitutionally infirm, that both Democrats 
and some Republicans want to keep. And I think Governor DeSantis says you can't do this. And so Popper, who is our expert on this and a national expert on this issue generally, because he's been doing this uh, redistricting fight or, or, or studying it and litigating it for decades, said, uh, this is wrong. You can't have these racially segregated districts like this. So that just shows you how important Judicial Watch's work is. I mean, we're not only litigating these issues in federal court, we're educating state legislatures about what the law requires and trying to uphold the rule of law. And I, I'm not aware of any organization doing this, this type of excellent work here. I mean, there are some that do a lot of it um, who are on our side. And the frightening thing is that we're almost alone. I can think of two or three other groups. I think I probably know the names of every lawyer who does this on our side of the philosophical divide. Those of us who defend election integrity, defend the Constitution, oppose this racialism the left is pursuing in election issues. And the left, they have hundreds of groups that do this. I talked about our North Carolina case. The left came in to try to challenge us there. Colorado, they came in. Los Angeles, they tried to come in. Pennsylvania, they're trying to come in if they're not already there. So we're, fa we're facing these far left networks funded by uh, people like Soros and company. So it's not just Judicial Watch versus the government. It's Judicial Watch versus the government and the well-funded leftist networks. It doesn't stop us, but it tells you how, how high the stakes are because they throw everything they can at us. So it's just great work. It's just great work. And before I go, I want to talk about some additional work we have been doing against uh, critical feminist theory in California. California's extremist state legislature and governor at the time signed into law uh, racial, uh, excuse me, gender quota requirements for private company boards of directors. We filed a lawsuit on behalf of taxpayers who said that California can't be enforcing with tax dollars something so outrageously discriminatory and, out, and, and confl that conflicts with the California Constitution, which, even, which, has even broader dis which has even broader prohibitions on sex discrimination and such than the federal Constitution. We were in trial for... It was a 27 day trial. And it's not, and that doesn't mean our lawyers were in trial for 27 days. It means our lawyers were there dealing with this in California for two or three months. Facing um, all these experts that the government of California was trying to come in to defend the indefensible before a judge in Los Angeles. We argue that the quotas for women on corporate boards violate the Equal Protection Clause of the California Constitution, among other provisions. At, gov at trial, government lawyers defending the quota have alleged that gender quotas not only remedy discrimination, but also improve overall corporate performance. Isn't that Aurelian? That discrimination helps the bottom line of corporations by mandating female uh, sex quotas you actually help business. Now, needless to say, there's no evidence that's the case. And even if it were, it wouldn't be justification to uh, require sex discrimination. Our expert at the trial uh, was quite excellent. Excellent. I encourage you to read our full release on it. Uh, but I want to I want to read you something that uh, he highlighted at the end of his testimony. And he talks about the dearth of uh, academic studies. So when you bring in experts, it's always a battle of the academics, right? And his analysis was the studies don't show that quotas work, uh, as the left was alleging at trial. And this is what he says. Perhaps my favorite study, just because the source of it is a literature review written in 2014 in the Delaware Journal of Corporate Law. Of course, Delaware is where all the corporations are, right? by Deborah Rode and Amanda Packle. The reason this is so notable is Deborah Rode, she's deceased now, was at Yale, and later when she was at Stanford Law School, she really was a founding mother of feminist legal studies and those sorts of things, but she was also a great academic and a very honest academic. 
And, her, and in her literature review in 2014, she said, you know, as much as people might want there to be a business case for diversity, meaning these gender quotas, the current literature does not support it. So you have this radical feminist academic who, as our expert says, is, is an honest academic. She couldn't find the support for the argument that our friends in California are trying to make to the judge that they should be able to discriminate on the basis of sex in requiring these quotas. Now, um, there's another uh, variation of the law that happened after they filed the, uh, or after the legislature passed in California, the uh, sex quota law. They expanded the regulation of corporate boards of directors to require quotas for race and LGBTQT status. So it's just throwing out virtually every law that we have against racial discrimination, sex discrimination, et cetera, as enshrined in the California Constitution and our federal Constitution. So it looks to me like the left has abandoned all pretense in pretending to support anti-discrimination laws. So we've got 60 years of anti-discrimination laws that began with the civil rights laws of the 60s, which uh, really furthered the Constitution protections, equal protection of the law. What does equal protection of the law mean? It means that you can't be discriminated against. The law protects you for being discriminated against. And that's in the 14th Amendment. That was the purpose of the amendment. And they don't believe in the, the, the 14th Amendment anymore. They don't believe in these anti-discrimination laws anymore because they're obsessed with this critical theory approach. And the way to enact critical theory, the critical theory agenda, whether it be race or the feminist theory agenda, whatever the variation of the Marxist thinking is, is to engage in actual discrimination to get wherever they want to go in terms of their Marxist utopia. Now, I'm sure our lawyers didn't talk about it like that before the judge, but I think that's what it is issue here. That's what's at issue here. This radical agenda that enforces discrimination against disfavored classes, in this case, males, in favor of, dis, uh, in favor of favored classes, in this case, women. And it's not just in California. You see it with Joe Biden and his selection process for the Supreme Court seat being given up by Stephen Breyer. He's embraced race and sex discrimination. He says, I'm going to appoint a black female. And evidently, they're not considering anyone else. Blatant discrimination by the president of the United States. I don't know if it's illegal or not, because the president's doing it. But I tell you, lawyers and judges involved in it are being compromised. I don't think they ethically could be involved in such a thing. And the Senate shouldn't abide by it either. And I tell you, if you haven't called your senators about this, I encourage you to let them know what you think about Joe Biden's race and sex discrimination selection process for the Supreme Court of the United States. What is the Senate going to do about it? Are they going to ratify it? Or are they going to say no? What do you think? Call them, 202-224-3121. So this is a broad assault on the rule of law by the left that pretends to be in favor of anti-discrimination, in fact, they're actually promoting discrimination contrary to the law and the Constitution. And it's Judicial Watch that's fighting it in court now. So a lot going on. And I want to encourage you to read this material, spread the word, and you'll see how important it is. And I hope I've described to you the importance of Judicial Watch sufficiently that if you aren't supporting us, you will support us with a financial contribution by going to Judicial Watch dot org judicialwatch.org find out what we're doing spread the word get the information out there and support our ongoing efforts to defend the republic from those who would tear it down thank you and i'll see you here next time on the judicial watch weekly update